Thank you. This week I had uh, the blessing. I was at a conference for Christian leaders and heard some tremendous, tremendous speakers. So God had a, a plan, even though I did not know it, and Matt did not know it, because he got a hold of me later on in the week, and uh, so I'm here preaching. But I was blessed by a certain message uh, in the conference where I was at by a man. I had a, my church uh, when I pastored outside New York City years ago, Urban Lutzer, who was a pastor of Moody uh, Memorial Church up in Chicago for 38 years. So I'm going to share his basic outline of blessed me. And evidently, God wants you to hear it, and it is going to bless you this morning. So before we go into this word, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, dear Lord, that uh, you would uh, just be with Pastor Matt, dear Lord, Amy, and the kids, and you would bless them, dear Lord, as, uh, again, uh, sickness has been in her home this week. I pray that you would strengthen them, give them complete healing. Others, dear Lord, I'm sure that also sickness may be in their home that you would bless also. But now, dear Lord, I thank you for each one of us that are here. I, I pray, dear Lord, that you would bless your word, that you would take these words, these truths, and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would implant them within our hearts, within our very being, dear Lord, that we may live out, dear Lord, these truths, and we would stand for you in the world in which we find ourselves, and we be encouraged knowing the God that we serve is all-powerful, almighty, and that your will will be done. Alexander Solzhenikin, uh, he lived in Russia during uh, the era of Stalin uh, back in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, he experienced the prison system over there, the gulags, and uh, later did come to the United States. In fact, it was in one of those prisons that he found, uh, through a doctor's testimony, uh, uh, Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He made this quote, how does freedom die? How does freedom die? And he answered with this, it dies in thunderous applause. Now, if you have ever read, it's a long book to read, all right, his, uh, his book, all right, the Gulag Archipelago, he describes a scene in that when, uh, again, during those years of Stalin's regime uh, in Russia. Uh, the year was 1937. Uh, the applause, all right, in that great auditorium was all the honored dictator, Joseph Stalin, at a conference of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Uh, the audience exploded in applause as he made, Stalin made his opening comments. Every person in the room jumped up to wildly clap, as if racing each other to see who would get to their feet the fastest. The applause was the honor of the dictator, Joseph Stalin. But the big question soon began, who would have the nerve to be the first person to stop clapping in honor of Comrade Stalin? No one had the courage, so the clapping went on and on and on. And you might wonder today, or if you're not a student of history, why anyone in the world would be afraid to stop clapping. Well, Stalin was that ruthless dictator he ruled uh, in Russia from 1922 to 1952, and just in the years of 1937 to 1938, he had one million prisoners put to death in his first uh, purge. Well, Alexander Solzhenitsyn described, all right, the scene, all right, in his book, The Gulag, all right? He says, and I'm going to quote now, the applause went on six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. The goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could, of course, cheat a bit, clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly, nine minutes, ten minutes. Insanity. To the last man, with make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope, the district leaders were just going to go on and on and on applauding till they fell where they stood till they were carried out on the hole on stretchers. At last, after about eight minutes, I mean 11 minutes, of nonstop clapping, the director of the paper factory finally decided enough was enough. He stopped clapping and sat down. A miracle. To a man, everyone else watching him sit down, you know what they did, right? Everyone else stopped dead and sat down also, Solzhenitsyn says. Well, that same night, the director of the paper factory was arrested. And he was sent to prison for 10 years. 
And authorities, you know, they came up with some reason for a sentence. But during the interrogation, he was told this. Don't ever be the first one to stop applauding. Don't ever be the first one to stop applauding. Now, keep in that in mind, I want you to turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. While you're turning there, let me recap probably a very familiar story to you. Israel is now in captivity in Babylon. The emperor at that time is a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar comes up with this great idea, thinking much about himself, that he's going to erect a 90-foot uh, image of himself, put it on the plane of door, call all the administrators, those in uh, leadership uh, within his entire empire, they will come, all right, to that plane, and he has a special praise band, all right, and when they strike up the music, all right, everyone is instructed to what? They're to bow, they're to fall down before that image. Of course, we know from the story that there was three young Hebrew boys, they did the unthinkable, they did not what? They did not bow. And of course, good neighbors, as many of them were around them, they came and reported this, all right, to the authorities and eventually came, all right, to Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to start reading in verse 13 of Daniel chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar was in a rage and fury, gave the commandment to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Now understand this. The king knows these men. If you understand the book of Daniel, all right, you remember Daniel and his three companions, these young men, all right, were elevated to places and positions of great importance within the kingdom. And so what he's thinking is these guys, you know, they just misunderstood. We're just going to have a reset, you know, and then once you understand what's going on, you're going to fall right in line. So Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them and said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down, worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is this God that is going to deliver you from my hands? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, This is the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar. We have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, in other words, what you're saying, that you're going to throw us into the furnace, our God, whom we serve, is able, I circled those words, our God is able, to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, I circled those words too, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, he was full of fury, and that the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he spoke and he commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments. And they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right, literally so hot, all right, that even those that were coming close to the entrance of that furnace, they were consumed. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the mist, bound, all right, into the fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste, and he spoke saying to his counselors, did not we cast three men into the midst of the fire? And they answered, and they said to the king, true, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. All right, what I want to give you this morning, let's start out, I'm going to give you three convictions that will give us the power, all right, not to bow. Having the faith to stand in a day 
when your faith will be shamed, when your faith will be questioned, when you'll be asked to compromise what the Word of God says, three convictions that you need to have firmly established in your heart and in your soul if you're going to stand and be the witness that God would have you to be. The first one is the conviction of the power and sovereignty of God. The power and sovereignty of God. If you look at this in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, we have no need. We're, you know what? We're not trying to figure out what answer you want to have. All right? We're not relying on our words. All right? We're not relying on our reasoning. Literally, we are not upset having to answer you. If that is the case, that we end up going, to, that you're going to condemn us into that furnace, our God whom we serve is what? Is able. I believe we need to have a conviction in our lives of the sovereignty and the power of Almighty God. Now, I wrote down, all right, a definition that I have of sovereignty. Sovereignty literally is God is absolute Lord over his creation. He is Lord of lords and King of kings over his creation. Uh, he exercises his rule. He is in total control. No matter what you think is going on, he is in total control. Total, absolute power rests in him. Now, in the midst of everything we experience in life, we look back when we missed the COVID, natural disasters, political turmoil, persecution, we need to remind ourselves, you know what? God is in control. That's what these three men understood is they're facing, all right, a furnace, all right, and they understood, you know what? I don't need to give in to fear. I don't need to, to give in to turmoil within my very soul because I understand that God is in complete control of my life in this world. You've got to ask yourself, do you believe that? I wrote down some verses. Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Daniel chapter 4, a little bit later in Daniel. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand. None can stop his will or say to him, what have you done? Let me go on. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. The Lord declares, my counsel will stand and I will accomplish all of my purposes. Not part of his plan, not part of his purposes, but I will accomplish all my purposes. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. We have a lot of people with a lot of plans, all right, for your life, my life, for this world, for the side in which we live. But understand, it is the purposes of the Lord that will stand. Psalm 135, 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. 2 Chronicles 20, 16. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. I need to understand that if I'm to stand in the world in which I live, I need to be convinced of the absolute power and sovereignty of Almighty God. We believe in that in the power and the sovereignty of God, and we rest and rely on that, not on our own might, not on our own power, not on our own understanding. I like. I came across this cute little illustration from years ago. This young boy was traveling by plane to see his grandmother, and he ended up having a seat next to this elderly gentleman, happened to be all right, a professor in the seminary, and the little boy was reading a Christian you know, paper, and so the you know, professor thought he'd mess around with him a little bit and have a little bit of fun. And uh, he asked this boy if he could tell him something that God could do, and that if he answered, you know, what God could do, then he could have this shiny red apple. 
Well, the little boy thought for a second and came back to that elderly gentleman, that professor, and said this, Mister, if you can, all right, tell me something that God can't do, I'll give you a whole bushel of those apples. And I, I believe we need to be convinced of this, understand that we have a God who is all power. I don't need to give in to fear. He is in control. You say it might not look like that. Whatever it looks like does not matter. God is in control and his will will be accomplished and his will will be done. I need to have that conviction. But there's a second conviction. The conviction of the providence of God. Here's something that's not preached on much and something we're a little bit uncomfortable with. And you see this in verse 17 and 18. They're telling the king, you know, we're not careful to answer you. We understand God's in control, all right? He's able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But in verse 18, they add these three words. But if not. In other words, it's not a guarantee that we will not be incinerated this day. But even if God does not deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods. Providence of God. Let me give you a little definition on that. That is talking about God's direction in governing his creation, ensuring that his good and perfect purposes are accomplished. Listen to that again. Providence is talking about God's direction, where he's going. In governing his creation, and we're part of that creation, ensuring that his good and perfect purposes are accomplished. Now you say, well, I'm okay with that. But we're really not many times. You know why? Because the providence of God is totally unpredictable to us. You can't track God. You don't know what he's going to do. Let me explain what I mean. That I believe that faith is trust in the unpredictable providence of God. Most times we don't understand or track God. You, I was talking to the Sunday school class this morning. Consider the unpredictability of God. You go to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, all right, talks about, all right, the martyrdom, all right, of one of the first apostles by the name of James. Her, who was that king, put James in before the people, before the Jews, had him beheaded, all right? And it says it pleased the Jews. But seeing that it pleased the Jews, you know what Herod decided? I'm going to put Peter in the prison, and then I'm going to do what to him? I'm going to cut off his head, all right? And again, it'll put me in favor, all right, with the people. But when I go to Acts chapter 12, and I start reading verse 5, it says Peter was therefore kept in prison, all right, kept to be martyred, but constant prayer was offered for him by the church. And when Peter, I mean, when Herod was about to bring him out, about to have him executed, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains, between two soldiers and guards before the door, keeping him in prison. Now behold, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck, all right, Peter on the side, raising him up, and it said, Arise quickly. His chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said, gird yourself, tie on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, put on your garments and follow me. And Peter went out of the prison. Here's the question. James, who was an apostle, had his head severed from his body. Peter, who was an apostle, got to go out of that prison free. Why? Why Peter and not James? Don't you think people would pray for all those apostles? Why one and not the other? Why one delivered and one dies? You know, you're like me. We were mentioning about prayer requests, praying for Pastor Matt and praying for others. And I'm sure you, if you're like me, you know folks with cancer. You know folks that have had COVID and many other things. And we spend much time in, in prayer for them. And we know with absolute certainty that we have a God that can heal. Am I right? But now, does everyone you pray for, are they healed? No. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, in this world, all right, and uh, go back to hell. You know, recently we have good friends, Jim and Sue McCann, that we've known them from years back, had three boys. Two of their boys died within 30 days. And I remember I was constantly praying for, for them. 
that they would not have to go through this. But both of those boys died. All right? I mean, different circumstances. One from cancer, one from complications of getting the COVID shot. All right? And uh, you wonder, we, I, I remember praying, Jerry Sneed came back from mission trip, Africa. And uh, all of a sudden, he got sick, all right, after he was home two or three weeks. And praying for him, and uh, I remember Dina was saying, he's getting better, and almost the next couple of days, he's dead, all right? And I'm saying that we don't know all the time what God's will is, what God's plan is. But even when I don't know, even when they are not healed, even when things don't go the way I wish they would go, I will still trust in God and I will not waver in my faith. See, we have too many believers that their faith depends on God doing everything that they want God to do. In other words, they have a wonderful plan for God. And if God does everything for them according to their plan and their will, then they'll trust him. Can I say that's not the way life is? I believe and we need to be firmly grounded in the providence of God. These three boys were. We sure hope we're going to be delivered. If I had a choice A and B, I don't want to go into that furnace. But even if God chooses, and they're saying he has the right to allow us to face that furnace, they end up saying, let it be known to you, all right, O king, that we will not, all right, bow to you. Uh, I don't know how many uh, saw the movie. It was now, it's a while back, as we haven't been able to go to the movies in a long while. Uh, Dunkirk, if you're a student of history, all right? That was the time, again, when the British and Allied forces, with about 338,000 men, were stranded, all right, uh, on the shore of a town called Dunkirk, backed up against the English Channel. The Germans had pushed them to that point, and uh, all of a sudden the Germans stopped believing that the British troops, I mean, they were doomed. They had the ocean behind them, all right, the, the Germans were all in front of them, all right? They believed the Allied troops had no choice but to what? But to surrender, all right? That you're going to surrender to us. But they would not, all right? And they end up the words of the, of the prime minister. Let it be known to you, we will not surrender. And if you know the outcome, the world saw the greatest evacuation ever. 338,000 men, all right, if you know, taking on really private boats, getting it across the English Channel. Same way, these three Jews, all right, their backs were against the wall, am I right? I mean, you're talking about the furnace is right in front of them, all right? Backs against it. And logically, it would be, do whatever the man says in order that you could see another sunrise. Am I right? But they said, no. We're going to stand in faith because they believed in the providence of God. Their faith was not tied on God doing everything the way they wanted it done. So I'm saying that, uh, again, our faith needs to be tied in the providence of of Almighty God. And it will seem time. You live long enough, you're going to have times where it's going to seem like your back is against the wall. Man, there is nowhere to turn. And you ask yourself the question, why has God allowed this? But we do not surrender our faith in the providence of God. He is working out His will and His purpose. I might not understand it now, but He is in control and he works all things together for what? For good. And we need to rely upon his providence. So conviction of the power of God. I need to have a conviction of the providence of God. And we sung about it this morning. All right? You must have known what I, I when Diane said. No. Now that is a miracle. All right? Because I, he didn't even know. Jason didn't know what I was preaching on. And I'm going, man, those songs fit right in. All right? The conviction of the presence of God. The presence of God. Because you read verse 19 to 25, they're thrown in the furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar, who was a pagan king, looks in, and God uses him to speak, all right, truth, biblical truth, that the fourth in the fire was like the what? Son of God. Man, a lot, all right? Who was that? Bible scholars believe pre-incarnate, all right, or our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
as those three men were thrown in, the Lord was there all right, to greet them. These three Hebrews did not know with certainty that they were going to be delivered. See, I read the story. All right, they delivered. That's a wonderful, cute story. Man, they didn't know nothing. All that they felt was the heat of that fire on their faces. They did not know that they would be delivered from the furnace. All right? If they would have bowed, though, think about this. They would have never experienced God's presence in that way that day. Can you think what that was? I mean, just, I, I came around. Walking, you as an individual, in the midst of a fire that just consumed the guards, incinerated them, and you're talking with Jesus. That's the experience that they I wonder what Jesus was telling them. <laughs> I mean, encouraging them in the midst of the fire. They would have never experienced that if they were not willing to go into the fire. See, many times we don't experience the presence of God in the way that he wants to manifest himself because we want to play life what? Safe. Don't want to put myself out there where I attract, you know, any attention. You see these three young men, all right? They were convicted that the presence of God was going to be there with them. And let me add this. Whether God delivers, delivers us or not, all right, you still are the presence of God, do you not? I might be lying in bed with cancer, praying for God's healing. Whether he heals me or not has nothing to do with God's presence. Deuteronomy 31, 8, the Lord, he is the one that goes before you. He is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Do not be in fear or dismay. So we see these three delivered, right, from that front. In fact, they came out, and they couldn't even smell smoke on them. I mean, you, when God does something, he does it all the way, right? Then you go in Daniel chapter 6. Remember the story about Daniel thrown into the lion's den? God delivers Daniel, doesn't he? Closes the mouth of the lion's. But can I say this? Plenty have died in the fires of persecution. Plenty have died. Families, individual believers in the Colosseum devoured by lions. All right? And that does not mean that God's presence, all right, was not with them. In fact, you know, usually people read Hebrews chapter 11, and we love the faith chapter. But they usually let off before they come to the end of that chapter. Because at the end of that chapter, after he talks about the deliverance of those that had faith in the Lord, he says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial, mocking, scourging, yes, of chains, imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom this world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Ooh. God's presence, we need to understand, is with us in the good times and is with us in the midst of the most horrible trials that we wish we never would have to face. That's why I love Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, that's what these three men were convicted of, whether in the furnace or whether out of the furnace. Didn't matter. God was there. He himself has said, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you. And I will never abandon or forsake you. And I'm saying in the world in which we find ourselves, we need to have those bedrock of convictions. The power of Almighty God. Uh, the, uh, again, the perseverance of God and the, uh, the presence of God. But let me give you also five, I wrote these down, practical lessons. I'm going to call them from Daniel chapter 3. I think that we need to understand five of them. The first one. Persecution is to be expected. You cannot live the Christian life and expect to escape persecution. You cannot live for him and think life is going to be easy and you are not going to attract any attention. 
I'm saying if you live a life founded on the truths of the Word of God, persecution is going to come your way. And we, we see it. You can see what is happening. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 14. Beloved, do not think it is strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceedingly joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. He said, don't think it's strange. You're going to have it. Sometimes we think, well, if I would have maybe framed it a little bit different. You understand, if they persecuted our Lord, what do you think, all right, that we are in store for? We're going to face persecution. But see, we live in America. And all you got to do is travel and know what's going on in the world. Christians all around the world are suffering persecution already, but we have this mentality in America, thinking, you know what? As a Christian, I shouldn't have to suffer. I shouldn't have that persecution. We almost would think that we have the Bill of Rights in our country, and praise God for the Bill of Rights. We almost think the Bill of Rights are our Christian heritage. You understand that's not. That's political. Read the Sermon on the Mount and discover what God tells us how we're to operate. It's almost opposite, all right? And I'm saying that we need to understand I got to persecution is going to come. The second thing we need to understand, I need to learn to stand alone. I need to learn to stand alone. There used to be a hymn we used to sing years ago. Though none go with me, still I will what? Everybody follow, right? Though none go with me, I will follow. See, we're going to need to teach our kids this, and we need to live it ourselves. You're going to be shamed for your faith. In fact, I think sometimes... The most powerful force that comes against us as believers is not outward persecution, but we're shamed. How can you be so stupid? How can you be so narrow-minded? How can you, you know, believe this? Especially if you go to college today, you listen to some of the things. I, I have a son-in-law. He's taken an advanced degree at a college I mentioned in Washington, D.C. He's reading for, for a business degree, international business. He's reading Karl Marx. That's required. You go, what? <laughs> I mean, it's like... I mean, understand, and they try to shame you if you do not fall, all right, into that ideology and shame you for your beliefs, all right? And I'm saying that we need to learn to be able to stand alone. You know, I, interesting thing. Most of us know Numbers chapter 13, 12 spies, right? That they were sent out by Moses to spy out the promised land. And there was two that came back with a positive report. What were their names? Caleb and Joshua, right? Now, who here is going to stand up, all right, and tell me who one of the other spies were? Name one of the ten. We don't know their names, do we? We don't. We don't. I'm telling you, when you stand alone, there's a testimony. People remember you. When you that's the story of these three boys, right? We remember them because out of all the multitude of countless thousands on that plane, they determined that they were going to stand alone. In fact, I, I've been reading. I like to read biographies. I was reading one on Hudson Taylor. Somebody was writing. And Hudson Taylor was that great missionary, uh, uh, again, to China, the tr that really transformed missions. And it was talking, he was a young man. What he ended up doing, he left his home. And he had pretty well to do, you know, home and the comforts where he lived. And he chose to go in the poor section, bad section of London, that where he had no friends, nobody, nothing to rely on, that he could learn before he went to China, that he could be in an environment where he had nobody but God, all right? And he had to stand alone on his faith. And I'm saying that we need to be able to understand to stand alone. I mean, it's good that we have other people beside us, but there's going to come times when we have to be able to stand alone and say, here's where I stand. So we need to... Uh, again, per expect persecution, learn to stand alone. And then we need to, here's a very important thing, fear God more than you fear the fire of persecution. These three guys feared God more than they feared that furnace. 
again, I, told you, I, I like history. And one of my devotionals I go through is, is early church history. One of the early reformers, a man by the name of John Huss, he was brought up in the Czech Republic back in the 1300s, born to peasant parents, um, ended up, uh, they lived in a town called Goose Town, all right? And his name, he shortened his name literally to the, what meant goose, all right? And if you read his early, uh, you know, when he was a teen and everything, he was always kidding. You, know, you think about that nickname, all right? Goose. And, uh, well, anyhow, he was influenced by John Wycliffe, and he put his faith in scriptures. He was in the priesthood. And he became convinced that Christ was the head of the church, and uh, really uh, the sins of what were going on in the church at that time. And people loved his preaching. I mean, he was found on the Word of God. The Pope didn't like it too much, all right? He got in problems. So the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at that time, a man by the name of Sigismund, all right, called for a church council. And he invited Huss and said, we want you to come and you'll be able to explain your views. We're going to have a council and everything. And he guaranteed us, we'll guarantee, we'll guarantee you safe journey there and safe journey home. Yeah, so much for that, right? He, he wasn't going to keep his promise, didn't keep it. As soon as Huss went into the city, he was put on trial of false charges, but he wasn't allowed to defend himself, all right? And I don't think it was asked, will you, in other words, uh, recant on your beliefs, and he refused to recant, all right? And they threatened him, and eventually he was uh, already burned at the stake. But uh, this was his witness, his exact words. God is my witness that the principal intention of my preaching and writings was uh, to solely betray uh, and uh, show that I might turn men from sin and in the truth of the gospel, I am willing to die today. You know what's interesting when you study it, all right, about him? His last words when they tied him to that stake and burned him alive. He says, you're going to, it's very ironic, he says, you're going to burn a goose today. But in a hundred years, you're going to have a swan that you can neither roast nor boil. You can look this up in history. A hundred years later, there was a man by the name of Martin Luther that started reading in the book of Romans and became convinced, all right, that salvation was by faith alone. 102 years from that burning of Huss, he put on the door of the cathedral his 95 thesis. Luther himself, when he came to trial on the Diet of Worms, he was supposed to be condemned to death. And if you study about it, he was praying all that night, deep agony, praying, all right, asking God, why? Why do you allow this to happen to me? Where are you, God? But the next day, this, these were his words. I am bound by Scripture. This is what he was telling his inquisitors. And I'm bound by conscience that is captive to the Word of God. And here I stand. May God help me. Whew. Right? Fear God more than the fires of persecution. All right? By the way, those words reinverb reverberated throughout Europe at that time. Many came to stand. But you know what's interesting? Is you look, Luther believed in his heart that he was the prophecy that Huss talked about when he went, all right, to the stake. And on the coat of arms, you look at this, the coat of arms of Luther is a what? Swan, all right? But I'm saying men of countless have chosen that their faith was in God, and they feared God more than they feared the fire of persecution. And I'm saying, I need to understand. When I know God's leading me in a certain direction, I, kid around, I was kidding around with, uh, you know, the group this morning in Sunday school, talking about, you know, going to Africa, mission trips. Sometimes, man, I got doubts and fears, but I'm afraid more not to do what God tells me to do. All right? And I'm saying, we all need to be that way. Let me give you a fourth one. We do not need freedom of religion to be faithful. Sometimes we've got this idea, I've got to have freedom of religion to be faithful to God. It's important. It's to be cherished. That's a great right we have in our nation. But can I say in history of this world, few people have had that. If I understand right, the first Christian martyr, Stephen, didn't have freedom of religion. Don't depend on freedom of religion. You have to understand we need to stand whether, quote, you have freedom of religion or not. All right? And the fifth one. Don't forget the power of the witness of one person who stands. See, people are looking at us, am I right? Don't forget the power of one witness who stands. 
You know, a great question people ask in Scripture is about Nebuchadnezzar. Will Nebuchadnezzar be in heaven? You know, I kind of believe this because if you look in, all right, Daniel chapter 4, and it gives the story about Nebuchadnezzar one day in his palace. He was looking about everything. Remember, he had the constant witness of Daniel and the three before him, all right? And he ends up saying, is this not great Babylon that I built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor, my honor and majesty? And it says, while the words were still in his mouth, voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. You'll be driven from men. Your dwelling will be the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like an oxen, and those seven times shall pass over you until you know the most high rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whoever he chooses. The mightiest man of the very the most powerful empire at that time all of a sudden was out grazing in grass. Says his nails grew like eagle's claws. All right. But then God restored his mind to him after that period of time. This is his testimony. This is, this is a pagan king's testimony in verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor, they returned to me. My counselor as my nobles resorted to me. I was restored to the kingdom and excellent majesty added to me. And he says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and I extol and I honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Woo! Right? The witness of Daniel, all right, those other three, all right, young men, and the experiences that he had. People are watching us. Never underestimate, whether it's your children, whether it's people at your workplace, the power of one witness. I think all of us remember the story of Esther, am I right? You remember Esther, the story recorded for us that she ends up winning the beauty contest. She's in the palace, becomes the queen of the emperor of Persia. And uh, there's a man, the prime minister at that time, by the name of Haman. A uh, very prideful man. And uh, everybody bowed to him except one man. That was uh, Esther's uncle, Mordecai. And that infuriated Haman. To the point he kind of deceived the king in the decree being made that all the Jews would be killed on a certain day. And uh, Esther's uncle, all right, sent to Esther and uh, told her, who knows that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You need to go see the king. And, of course, in those days... Even the wives could not just walk into the king's presence. Uh, if you walked in his presence uninvited and he did not uh, hold out a scepter, you were put to death. And she could, tried to explain to him, you know, I, I'm going to die for this. And uh, he ends up telling her, you're the one. And then if you remember her words, she said, if I perish, I perish. And she goes, here's what I was thinking. Great time to be alive today. Who knows that you and I are not here for such a time as this? Instead of moaning and groaning of what's going on, maybe this is a great time to live. Where my light and my faith can make more of an impact than maybe any other time. And whether I perish, I perish. My life is in God's hands. I serve a God who's all-powerful. He is, rules over all his creation, and his presence is with me in life and in death. wonder if I can have every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. I don't know where you're at today and what situation is going on in your life, but maybe you feel, and maybe honestly you are in some respect, your back is against the wall. You feel that you have nowhere to turn. You don't understand what God's doing. That uh, you don't, maybe it could be about your health, maybe job situation, maybe about a loved one. But you don't know. And temptation is to panic. Maybe this morning you need to stand. You need to understand that you serve a God who is all-powerful, whose providence rules all, 
and his presence is with you. And you determine by the word of God that you're going to stand strong in your faith. And you're going to trust him. It might be in the college classroom, might be in a high school, might be at a workplace. I don't know where it is, but you determine the grace of God. You know what? I'm going to stand. And I'm going to trust him. Maybe this morning you need to come and just bow before this altar. We usually give the opportunity that you be able to come and just recommit yourself to him. Maybe you need to pray over a lost loved one and God would use your testimony in their life. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to ask if everyone would stand this morning. Everyone standing, heads bowed, eyes closed. The praise band is going to sing a couple verses of praise. If you need to come to this altar and bow before God, the all-powerful creator, the Lord of your life, take this opportunity.